Happy New Year to you. It is a joy to join with you. Do me a favor, if you would, turn your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. As we watch a highlight video from the preceding year, I just rejoice that all the things that God has been doing, that God is doing in our church, it is amazing to me to see how many lives are being impacted, how many lives are being transformed. And I just want to say kudos to you guys. I greatly appreciate you. So we're in Matthew chapter 6. You know, there are certain times, certain seasons that we pause to reflect about the year that has passed and that we pause to anticipate the year that's coming. Sometimes it's a birthday. Sometimes it's an anniversary. And sometimes it's the eve of a new year. As we come to the first Sunday of this year, we want to share with you the vision that God has put on the heart of of our church leaders, as pastors and core leaders of our church, every year we are seeking God's direction, God's vision for our church for the coming season. And we want to share that with you because we think as it applies to us as a church community, but also as it applies to us as individuals in this church community, that it has an opportunity to revolutionize our life. We believe that as we come to the brink of a new year, that we should come with a sense of anticipation that God wants to do something different in our lives, that we can rejoice at what God has done that has been good, and we can give praise to God for that, but we should also come with a sense of anticipation that God desires to do some new things in our life. And as we come to this year, I presume that many of us are, are wondering God, what do you want to do in my life? More than maybe a New Year's resolution, uh, dare I say, a, a New Year's revolution. Something that God wants to do that's revolutionary in the sense that it changes the status quo. Rather than simply an incremental inch, there's a big step, a leap in the direction of God that would transform our lives, transform our families, transform our community, and transform our world. I'm going to start it with you and uh, just read one verse from the Gospel of Matthew. It's in the sixth chapter, and it's words that are very familiar to many of us. We find it at verse 10. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray with me. Uh, Father, we just thank you for an opportunity to contemplate those words. May they not be simply a praise or a prayer on our lips that aren't reflected in our lives. May it be a passion of our life. May it be a purpose 
of our life. May it be, Lord, a reality. And Father, we pray that as we have gathered here to rejoice with you, that you're going to speak to us and encourage us. We give you all glory. And we commit this time to you now. In Jesus' name, amen. So the object or the subject we're going to consider is the vision and the mission for Calvary Nexus. Calvary Nexus mission and our, our vision moving forward in this coming year. Really the objective that I think God has in store for us is that he would encourage each of us to take the next step. Whatever the next appropriate step would be for you to connect, to grow, and to reach. The next step to connect, to grow, and to reach. And, and so as we contemplate this, the, the first place I want to stop with you is just to consider what our mission is. Now, e every church is part of the capital C church, Christ Church. Amen? But each local church should have a, a sense of its identity, the unique values, the unique gifting, the unique calling, its unique purpose, its unique place in its community, and the larger body of Christ. And the mission doesn't change too rapidly. The, the mission stays the, the same over extended periods of time, and we would contrast that in a moment with a vision that might change every year or every year or two. So what is this church all about in terms of our mission? We feel that our, our mission is that, that we make disciples and develop leaders to reach our world for Jesus. We make disciples and develop leaders to reach our world for Jesus. Now, some of the ways that, that we do that, that are, are distinct, not unique, just distinct. We are, are really focused here on, on challenging each of us, encouraging in a loving place of acceptance, encouraging in a loving place of grace, but challenging us to give Jesus his rightful place as the Lord of our lives. And so we want to encourage and equip people to be committed followers of Jesus. And we do that through community groups. We do that through teaching verse by verse through the scriptures as we go through books of the Bible. We do that in our school of ministry. We do that through our internship training program. We do that through our fellow church leadership resources. We do that through teacher training. We do that through the church planting network, a global church planting initiative. Lots of opportunities here to become disciples, to be developed as leaders, and also to reach our world for Jesus. Through our, our Beyond Sunday community service, we, we serve our community, and that creates bridges to share the gospel. Where each of our major service projects that we did the last year, we saw anywhere from 30 to 80 decisions made for Jesus. Praise God! This is great stuff, amen? Uh, to appreciate that we support missionaries around the globe, we were blessed to send out over $100,000 last year to support global missions, and we are sending missionaries from this church to serve in other parts of the world. These are ways that we are looking to reach our community. We want every single person here to feel equipped and encouraged to be able to share your faith with those who don't know the Lord and those who are unchurched so that you would have the privilege of being part individually in reaching our world. And, and so we do that in, in a host of different ways here. One of them is, is the fact that we have two campuses. It's one church and two campuses. Most of you are aware who are here that not only do we have our campus here on, on Mobile Avenue, but we have the Lewis Road campus. And I, I caution them to say Mobile Avenue because if I say it's the mobile church, it would sound like we're just the hipster church. You know, it's like this undercover church and they're going to tweet where they're going to meet and it's a mobile place, man. You got to be following following them to find out where they are. But we're one church at, at two campuses, but that gives us the opportunity as part of our leadership development focus and mission to raise up a teaching rotation. Uh, to my friends at Lewis or whenever or wherever you're listening, we would encourage you. My typical approach is I alternate. So I'm here at Mobile on the second and fourth Sundays generally, and I'm over at our Lewis Road campus on our first and third. And when I'm at one campus, one of the other teachers in our teaching team is at the other. And so we are raising up teachers to advance God's kingdom. 
Also, if you've been here for a while, you've noticed that there are multiple worship teams. We have over a dozen worship teams that lead us as we praise God. Amen? So there's nothing wrong with having a one gifted worship leader to lead. I think that that's a blessing. But we are, are privileged here to raise up many worship leaders and worship teams so that we are not only encouraging with a different style of worship as each one leads, but we are developing them as leaders in God's kingdom. And so this is a focus of our mission generally. And that's something that remains constant through the years. But what about the vision? What's our vision for Calvary Nexus in 2016? We want you to know what the vision is, and we hope and pray that it resonates with you. And it flows from this idea that we just read in Matthew chapter 6 at verse 10, where we read the words, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we believe that the vision for our church is to see Jesus as our king. For Jesus to be our king, to continue to see a culture of people who are passionately in love with Christ, reverently in love with God, such that they want to yield to God in every realm of their life. As we come to the sixth chapter of Matthew's gospel, many of us are aware that there at chapter 6, verse 10, we find ourselves right in the middle, so to speak, of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' kingdom manifesto. He is there explaining to the disciples the multitudes that had gathered, the values of the king, the nature of of the kingdom and to encourage them to enter in and make Messiah, Jesus Christ, their king. And in the midst of this great teaching, the, the greatest teaching that the world has ever contemplated, the, the greatest lesson that the world has ever considered, Jesus, in this great message that we see as Matthew 5 to 7, starts off and shares what we describe as the Beatitudes. And so these are the blessings of the kingdom life. And the primary blessings of the kingdom life are that we get the king, we get the kingdom, and we have the satisfaction and purpose of living to advance that kingdom, to know him and to make him known. And as he's talking about these Beatitudes, it's not simply the blessings or Beatitudes, it's in effect what our attitudes should be. And then Jesus reveals to us the standard of the kingdom and why we need a king who is not only our sovereign Lord, but as our Savior. And he's not simply raising the bar, so to speak. He is showing us where the bar has always been. He said, you have heard it said, don't murder. But I say to you, if you have unresolved anger in your heart, it's just as if you murdered. And then he says, you have heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, if you have lust in your heart, it's just as if you've committed adultery. You've heard it said, love your neighbor like you love yourself. But I say to you, love your enemies. And in each sense, we, we get the, the sense that, that this bar is such that we cannot simply conform with outward actions, but the inner attitude of our hearts None of us measures up. And we need a savior. We need a king who can give us access to the kingdom. And then, as we come to the seventh chapter, there in the midst of the seventh chapter, Jesus says, you will know them by their fruits. The lifestyle, the characteristics of our lifestyle will reveal whether we genuinely have a relationship with God, whether we are genuinely born again by the lifestyle, by the characteristics, by the traits, by who we are. It'll be evident whether we're subjects of this king, Christ, or another worldly king. And then he said, in that last day, there'll be many who will come and say, look what I did for you, Jesus. And the Lord will say, depart from me. I don't know you. It's a sober warning in a, the midst of a very encouraging exhortation from a king who loves his subjects and welcomes all who are listening to enter into his kingdom. 
And then he concludes in the verses that we read as Matthew chapter 7, verses 27 to 30. And there he describes only two building plans. You know, we have a lot of tract homes in, in Camarillo, new developments throughout Ventura County. And you go to get a new home and you look at the models and there's all these different elevations, all these different floor plans that you can choose. But it's not that way in God's kingdom. Two floor plans. Now, I could say it's take it and leave it, but <laughs> let me describe it the way Jesus did. He said there was one man who was foolish. And the reason he was foolish is that he heard the words of Jesus, but they went in one ear, out the other, and that man never sought to actually apply those lessons to his life. And he's called a fool because he's like a man who builds his house on sand. And when the storms of life come against that house, it won't stand because of the foundation that it's built upon. The other man is described as wise. He hears the words of Jesus and seeks to apply those words to his life. And he is described as building his house upon a rock. And the same storms of life beat against his house as the foolish man. The difference is, because he built his house on the rock, it stands. Now, when I was in college, my, my roommate had the epic tropical fish aquarium. I mean, this thing was enormous, like SeaWorld size, you know? And, and so there are all the cool tropical fish, and then there's the diver guy who's there with his little diver helmet, and the bubbles come up, and he's fastened to the rock, and all the fish swimming by. And I used to think, like, it'd be so cool to be that diver guy with all the fish swimming by. But then we had an earthquake, and water was tossed, and fish were on the ground. Fortunately, all the fish were rescued. No fish were hurt in the making of this story, let me just say. <laughs> but the diver guy, he didn't move an inch. He was fastened to the rock. And I learned a lesson that day. And I hope we all learn this lesson. We, we need to be fastened to that rock. That's what a disciple is. It is someone who is committed to Christ, such that they make Jesus the king in every realm of their life. Now, consider this with me. If a disciple, if we were saying, well, what is a disciple? And we could describe it in the Greek term mathetes, that a disciple is a follower or one that is an apprentice. But we say, okay, but what does that mean? And I would say to you that the, the simplest definition, although it has many layers to it, a disciple is someone who wants to make Jesus king in every realm of their life. And let me suggest to you that all of our lives and all of the issues of our lives could simply be boiled down to the ideas of these six silos or realms. You have a personal realm. For some of you here, a marriage realm. For all of us here, a family realm, whether you have children or, or simply parents that you're seeking to honor, whether they're alive or have passed. You have a career realm. You have a community realm defined in various ways. And then a calling realm. How you are gifted and called by God to represent him and to serve him beyond your work and beyond your family. And let me suggest that anything you can consider in your life will fall into one of those silos or one or more of those silos. And the question becomes then for us, what would it look like to actually make Jesus the king in that realm. Now just think about this with me for a moment. See, it is our plan to begin our studies through the Gospel of Matthew next Sunday. And here's the plan. Here we teach through books of the Bible, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, chapter by chapter, from the first chapter to the last chapter, and then we start other books of the Bible. And so our plan is to spend approximately 88 weeks going through the Gospel of Matthew together. And if Jesus shows up before we're finished to gather us to be with him, I think we're all going to be okay with that if we're in Christ. Amen? Amen? And if he delays his coming, that is our plan for the next year plus. And while we do that together, we're going to try to unpack what it would look like for Jesus to be king in that realm. For example, if I was to say to you, the idea of Jesus being king in the realm of your family, 
What might come to mind? Somebody raise a hand and start us off. What, what does it look like? What would it look like for Jesus to be king in that realm of your life? Somebody raise a hand and get us started. Yes. Reading God's word together. Great start, Janice. Yeah, what else might it look like? It's a great start. What else? Yes, Stephanie. Family prayer. Family prayer, great start. Roman. Family prayer. We have two for family prayer. Okay. What else? What might it look like? What did it look like? Yes, Sue. Um, the parents the yeah, for parents to lead their life in such a way that children can see the example for Christ. For those of you at the Lewis Road campus who have your hands raised, I can't see you, sorry. Um, those of you at Mobile, who else? What, what does it look like? Yes. Ah, Joy says to get the whole family plugged into a church community. So imagine, as we go through the Gospel of Matthew, we'll spend one to two months in each of those spheres. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a biblical basis. What does the Bible tell us in that sphere? We're going to consider some of the practical applications that you've mentioned and others. And together, we're going to contemplate and we're going to encourage to experience what it looks like to make Jesus realm, Jesus Lord in that realm. And then we're going to encourage you guys to be able to share how you applied those lessons in your life and the changes that it made. Now that's the plan. Now let me just encourage you as you think about this for a moment. Many of us, I would estimate about 50% of us, have approached this time of year contemplating a New Year's resolution. Let, just watch this. How many of you have thought about a New Year's resolution? Just raise your hand. I'm not going to call on you to share it. Just raise your hand. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. How many of you? Okay. So let's say a little less than, than 50%. And, and so the research shows that in the United States, 49% of people in this country have a New Year's resolution. Now, it's interesting because those who have an express New Year's resolution, hear this, are 10 times more likely to reach a goal by the end of the year than those who have no New Year's resolution. And that's encouraging about perhaps the benefit of having a goal in mind. But as you contemplate in this country what you think would be the top six or maybe the top ten New Year's resolutions, what do you think some of these New Year's resolutions might be in this country? Somebody raise a hand. Yes. Getting fit and just says that, that actually shows up third on the list. Getting fit and healthy or staying fit and healthy. Who else? Yes. Getting finances in order. That's also in the top six. Yes. Yeah, to, to be more social, to have more friends. Good. Uh, good. What else? Yes, Kai. Uh, get a better job. Get a better job. Another resolution. Yes. Quit smoking actually makes it in the top six. Yes, number six. Quit smoking. What else? Yeah, to save money. Actually, number five. Good job, Emma. What else? Yes. Get organized. Actually shows up number two on the list. Good one. <laughs> to lose weight. Number one on the list. <laughs> and, and, and nobody wants to share that one. Like, yeah, if you lose it, somebody else will find it. Uh, <laughs> but as you contemplate the... Dominant New Year's resolutions in this country as expressed by 49% of the people in this country. As you look at the list of the top 10, nothing, not one of those resolutions has anything to do with relationship with God or the spiritual sphere. Now here's the thing. A New Year's resolution arguably can benefit your life and change your life. And that's a good thing. But let me suggest this. Instead of settling for just a resolution, I'd like to propose that we contemplate a revolution. Now, I'm not speaking of revolution in the sense of anarchy against the government. I'm contemplating revolution in the sense of something radically different, where we as a community of faith really approach the idea of what would it look like for Jesus to be 
king in my life. And let me propose it to you this way. If I throw out the idea to you about the idea of Jesus being king in the world, like how good would it be if Jesus actually exercised right here, right now, the authority that is his in this world? Because all authority belongs to him if he actually exercised it so that there was no evil, that there was justice, that there was mercy, that there was love, that there was grace, that there was holiness, people set apart to God. Would that make the world a better place? Yeah. Ah, you see how quickly we can resonate with the idea that if Jesus is in charge, it's a better thing. So why do we struggle about making Jesus Lord in our own life? And just contemplate this with me for a moment. Not only do you get the king, you get the kingdom. And you get purpose and meaning of life of seeking to know him and making him known to advance his kingdom. So that everything that you're really yearning for, everything that you're longing for in life, now finds alignment because Jesus is king. And Jesus has to be king in every realm. In other words, that same person that is here Sunday morning lifting up their hands, praising God, and I rejoice in that, loves God just as much in the workplace. And although God might be represented differently, there's no compromise. And that same person is in the family, in the household. Not a perfect parent or a perfect young person, but willing to own up when we blow it, willing to ask forgiveness, willing and seeking to grow in Christ. Amen? That our neighbors, our community, would know of our love for God. In the personal realm, things that we know that we should be doing, we start doing more of them by the Spirit of God. Things that we need to stop doing, that we stop doing them more by the Spirit of God. Now, why is this revolutionary? Uh, why do I suggest that? Well, here's the thing. Church demographers and missiologists, those who, who study church demographics and a church missiology mission uh, as a global concept, here's the thing. In any culture, among any people group, that if you can reach 2 to 5%, two to five percent of a people group. It's called a reached people group. And the reason why it's considered reached, we think like five percent, that's not very much, let alone two percent. Why would it be considered a reached people group if only two percent of that population is on board? Now here's the reason. If two percent of the people are committed in their relationship with Christ to make him king, that is sufficient leverage to influence a whole people group. Isn't that amazing? Now, here's a remarkable idea. In a community of 60,000 people, you would need a, a group of about 1,200 people to effectively create that kind of leverage, 2%. Now, by the grace of God, this church that started in our living room 19 plus years ago with five people, God has graciously grown to a community of almost 1,200 worshipers on a weekend. And that creates leverage. That encourages me because I, I'm, I'm a dreamer. Uh, just like Joseph was a dreamer. That I believe that God wants to do great things. I'm not... Uh, naive in the sense that I, I don't understand the challenges, nor am I naive in the sense that I walk into a room full of manure and think, oh, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> I've been doing this for over a quarter century, and I understand the challenges. I am not naive to it. We are free will moral agents, and we're a good church, a church full of good, great, wonderful, loving, gracious, accepting people. But here's the challenge. If every one of us, as an individual and as a church community, really took the mantle and said, oh, okay, this year I'm, I'm going to make Jesus king in every realm of our life, every realm of my life, and I'm going to let that spill out to influence my family, my friends, do you think it would be different? 
I, I think so, because I don't, as good as it is, I don't think we're there yet. Amen? Is that where God would have us be? Absolutely, because that's what it means to be a disciple. Yes, we're saved by the grace of God. It's what Jesus did for us. But we will know that we are saved people because we have sought to make Christ king in every realm of our lives. And that excites me. Does that excite you? Because here's the tendency for all of us. We live in a world that is enticing. We live in a world where our affections can be distracted. So of course it's a good thing to love your children. Of course it's a good thing to love and honor your parents. Of course it's a good thing that, that you can enjoy the gifts, the material pleasures that God has allowed in this world. Of course it's a good thing that God gives us time so we can enjoy recreation. And yet, each of us is confronted that there are certain things in our life, our hobbies, our recreation, our careers, our accomplishments, our spouse, our kids, our parents, whatever it might be that knocks Jesus off the throne and makes either ourselves or some other affection king. And that's what hinders us from experiencing what we're really searching for, the comfort of being his subjects, the comfort of being part of his kingdom, the comfort and satisfaction of having a purpose for living. Don't you want more of that this year? I know I do. I know I do. And, and so... That is the, the vision, but what are some of the values that, that are motivating that, that vision? What are some of the values that motivate what we do? And, and quickly, I just want to share with you. Uh, first of all, we look to connect with Christ with others. We connect with Christ with others. Can you connect with Christ alone apart from others? Absolutely. Is there greater value to connecting with Christ with others as far as understanding the nature of the kingdom? Absolutely. So, weekends, Sunday gatherings, we come together to learn the word of God and we come together to praise God both as expressions of worship to God. You saw some of the large scale events that we're able to do uh, as a way to connect those who are outside of a relationship with God into a relationship with God as great outreach efforts. Absolutely. And yet those great large scale outreach events, as wonderful as they are, those are periodic dates on the calendar. Weekend gatherings happen every week, and it's intended to be a Sabbath, so to speak, where we take a step away from all of the distractions of the life around us, and we lift our eyes and we focus on God, and we say, Lord, I'm going to put you first. And that's a challenge. There's nothing wrong. That, in other words, nobody's taking attendance that you have to be here every week. You, it's not that you're here or not here and you're right or you're wrong with God or you're good or you're bad with God. To understand the benefit and the satisfaction when you say yes to God by saying no to something else. You know, I, I, many of you who know me understand that I am a, a diehard Dodger fan. And so by the grace of God, some friends here in the church who, who might have pity on me have offered tickets. And tickets are always are offered for a Sunday game or a Wednesday night game or a Tuesday night game where I'm here at the church. And I have a choice to make. And depending where the seats are. No. What I've discovered is, and it's not simply that I pastor the church, I'm one of the pastors of the church. Just as a follower of Christ, it says, it feels really good to say, God, I'm going to put you first. That, yeah, I know I can do this, I know it's okay, but I'm going to put you first. And let me just say this, I don't have any regrets there are times where I've looked at the score and it's, oh my gosh, I wish I was there. But that's why God invented ESPN. <laughs> I could see the highlights, right? 
And let me encourage in this. If you make a commitment to regularly be here Sundays or another healthy Bible teaching church, if that's where God leads you, if you make a commitment, I'm going to be there regularly to worship God and to learn, I will assure you that at the end of the year, you'll be in a much better place than if you don't. It's not because my assurance means anything. It's because God has promised to bless his word. God has promised to be in the midst when we come together corporately. And you don't want to miss that. You need others, and others need you. Which brings me to the next idea, that we grow in Christ with others. And when we're talking about grow, there's really two ideas here. Two ideas. And one is having an intentional plan for spiritual growth. An intentional plan for spiritual growth. And the second idea is getting involved in a authentic community, in a smaller community. So one thing I'd encourage you to write down is reading plan dot calvarynexus.org reading plan dot calvarynexus.org one of the the basic steps for us to be intentional about spiritual growth is to have a reading plan for the word of god through this year now i, I approach it and there's a couple of reading plans that are available on the church website that you just see and uh, as you navigate the app or you navigate the site you'll see these reading plans one that i like man New Year's Day, it starts in Matthew chapter 1 at verse 1. By the time I get to Easter, I have finished the New Testament. Hallelujah. And then I start in Genesis, and I read through Genesis to Malachi so that on New Year's Eve, I can celebrate that I read through the Word of God. Now, it's not just some task that, oh, wow, I checked it off, so now I'm all spiritual. What I've discovered is I need the Word of God. I love to spend my mornings, start my day with the Word of God. And so uh, my day typically starts with amazing coffee because God's blessed me with amazing coffee. It's Christian crack. It's okay. <laughs> and I'm the first one up, and uh, soon after I get up, the dog gets up for a treat, and the coffee is brewed, and then I sit down with the Word of God. Because my life is better when I hear from God and the people around me enjoy me more when I saw God's face before I started running my face. And it's the same for you. We need to grow in the word of God. We need to take the word of God in in context so that we can understand God and respond to God. An intentional spiritual plan to, to create some accountability in your life, whether it's with peer-to-peer -peer mentors but I think the best way is in a community group. Uh, presently in our church, there's about 60 community groups. They meet all throughout the county, different nights, different days, different emphases, some focusing on marriage, others on spiritual disciplines, others going through books of the Bible, etc. And we want to encourage you. We understand that taking that step to get involved in a community group can be scary, can be uncomfortable. You're thinking like, what if there's people that I don't like? Let me, let me dispel that fear. There will be. <laughs> Grow up. Deal with it, you know? And it's not like everybody loves you like you're all that, okay? <laughs> Second, what if there'll be people there that I don't know? Let's hope so. If everybody there is somebody you know and somebody you, you get along with and everything is perfectly aligned, what's going to push you to grow and to discover your rough edges? Well, what if I go and I really don't like it? Well, then try another group. Well, what if I don't like that one? Well, try another group. If you try 10 and you don't like any of them, maybe you're the problem, okay? <laughs> yeah. Uh, young people, you've got midweek community. You can get involved. The junior high meets Wednesday night. Senior high meets Thursday night. That's fantastic. But you need a smaller group where you can develop authentic relationship. Because uh, obviously in a church this size, as much as I might want to love and care for every single one of us individually, I can't. And it's not that I don't care and it's not th that I I'm bad or, or anything like that. It, it's simply not what God designed. God designed for us to come together to encourage one another that we could help one another to grow up in the faith. Our job as pastors is to help equip all of us so that we can encourage one another to experience a one another life. And so when you come together with a group of people once a week, you create accountability. 
You encourage one another. I don't know about you guys, but I need accountability. I'm a squirrely little guy. I'm just telling you straight up. If I don't have accountability in my life, I wonder what might happen. My people in less than 40 days and 40 nights were holding up a golden calf saying, this is our God. It doesn't take long, you guys, to find ourselves drifting. And nobody here wants to experience that. And the best antidote for that is not only getting our hearts right with Christ, but creating accountability. So I want to encourage you in that. This year, maybe the first step for you is saying, okay, I'm going to commit to regularly attend weekend worship services. Maybe the next step for you is I'm going to create an intentional plan for spiritual growth this year. I'm going to take some of the classes. I'm going to connect in a a community group. I'm going to be reading the Bible. I'm going to develop a a peer-to-peer mentor relationship, whatever it might be. I encourage you. Maybe you're ready for that step. A third value is that we want to reach our world with others for Jesus. We want to reach our world with others for Jesus. So not only are we doing global missions, not only do we have a free youth center that operates on the Lewis or at the Lewis Road campus, but we want to focus on the ideas of service and evangelism. And the reason for that is is that First of all, ideally, each and every one of us at the end of this year would be able to say that we had shared our faith, and even better, that we had been used by God to lead someone to Christ. And it's here. For some of us, it's like, oh my gosh, I'd love to do that, but ah, I don't know if I can. We want to equip you. We want to encourage you that each of us can be involved in sharing our faith. And if God so wills to draw someone into the kingdom and use you to do it, you are equipped more than you even realize, I believe, to mentor them, to disciple them. I believe that you guys could do this, and I know that we all should do this. That'd be pretty exciting. It's pretty scary to step out, but it's pretty exciting. And here's the thing. No regrets at the end of this year. No regrets that we missed out on something. I, I remember as, as uh, our sons were small, we were once at a swimming hole where there was a ledge where you could jump into the swimming hole. And my boys watched as I walked up on that ledge and I looked down and, oh, no, no, no. Heights scare me. When, when you spend as much time as close to the ground as I do, you could understand that, you know? And I, I just, no, I can't do that. My boys are down there looking at, come on, Dad. Oh, and I felt so humbled when I walked back down that path with my proverbial tail between my legs. And my kids wouldn't even look at me like, he's not with us. No, no, they didn't do that. I have no, no regrets. We don't want at the end of the year to think, man, I I should have done it. We all know this is the year we want to be able to say each one reach one. Not that it's the mark of what makes us a Christian. Not that if you don't do this, you're not saved or you're bad or anything. But we want to because God's put that desire in our heart. And to serve him. Between the two campuses and all that goes on here, guys, it it literally takes hundreds of volunteers at both campuses each week for church to happen. And many of you are involved in serving in various ways, and that's fantastic. But I want to encourage you. Serving, as many of you have already discovered, is an incredible way to grow in your relationship with God and to be used to reach others for the Lord. And you got to find a place where you can serve. You have to figure out whether it's this local church, another, some parachurch organization where the gifts that God has given you, where you can use those gifts rather than simply coming and consuming, that you discover that God's given you those gifts to advance his kingdom. And I want to encourage you. You're going to find yourself satisfied because you knew that you were being used to reach your world for Jesus. Whether it was our world locally here in Camarillo, whether it was our world in the county, whether it's our world in Southern California, whether it's the world in regard to the globe, you got to get up out of your seat and use the gifts that God has given you if you want to be part of the kingdom that is seeking to advance. Amen? Now, the last value we talked about 
connecting with Christ with others, growing in Christ with others, reaching our world for Christ with others. The last value, you see it up on the wall, loving God and living his word. There are both campuses. We remind ourselves that our love towards him is what motivates all of these actions, all of these attitudes. But our love towards him is simply responsive to his love towards us. The reason we rejoice at, at Christmas is because God loved us so much that he came into this world to live a perfect life, that we could relate to God, that God would empathize with our struggles, but to be a perfect sacrifice. Christmas is awesome. But the thing about Christmas is it makes Easter possible. We're not made right with God because of Christmas. We're made right with God because of what happened on the cross on Good Friday, what was proven three days later in the resurrection. And we rejoice because of the love that God showed for us. We want to love him and we want to live his word. We want to take what we're learning and apply it in our lives. We want to keep learning and build that solid rock that when the storms of life inevitably hit up against it, that we're not going to be rocked. And that's radical. That's revolutionary. And that typically amongst us is going to require change. And the only thing that's going to motivate us to make those kind of changes individually and as a community of faith is to understand what God has done for us in the cross. So we want to encourage you. If you just look at the Connect card that you received in the program or on the app, that Connect tab, you'll find all the ways that you can get involved in a community group. You'll find all the ways that you can get involved in an area of service to check it out. You're not signing your life away. But hear me, listen. Is this going to be another year where the passion is waned, where the fire has seemingly diminished? Or is this going to be a year of zealous passionate love for God because the rightful king is here and we have decided we are going to make him king in every realm of our lives. Amen? Yes. And so we're going to ask the ushers to come forward to present to us the elements of communion. And I'm going to ask, if you would, to hold on to the elements and just to take a, a moment with me to reflect If you would, just take a moment to think about what the next step might be for you. And there's nothing that I could say in terms of an impassioned plea or a logical argument that's going to motivate anyone here to change. The only things that are really going to motivate change is an understanding of what Christ has done for us and a willingness to yield to the work of the Holy Spirit. I firmly believe from the scriptures that God wants us to yield to him in every realm of life. That's what it means to be filled with or controlled by the Holy Spirit. And the question of being filled with the Holy Spirit isn't the idea that you have leaked and therefore you're a quart low and we need to top you off with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit means that every realm of our lives, every sphere of our lives, we're ready to make a decision to yield to Christ. And every single one of us, me first, is aware that there's areas in our life where Jesus isn't first. And it's really easy for us to see others' deficiency, the areas in other people's lives where they need to submit to God. But that does nothing to equip us to make Jesus king. And so what I'd ask you to do before we partake is just to contemplate the cross. Just to remember, as Jesus said, what he's done for us. That no one took his life. He laid down his life. He voluntarily gave his life so that we could live. And I tell you guys, for all of us, it's so easy to rationalize that, yeah, Jesus is Lord in every realm of my life. 
But I think it's time we allow the Holy Spirit just to, to show each and every one of us what the Lord would have us do. And then ask him to change us. And so if you'll close your eyes and open up your hearts, Father, this is a season where we reflect. We thank you for what you've done in our lives in the past year. Lord, we thank you for what you did in our lives and giving us life and eternal life. We thank you for what you're doing, and we thank you in advance for what you will do. And Lord, we're asking that you would help us to see our need for a revolutionary change to do something radical, to truly allow you to be Lord in our lives as individuals and in this place, to impact the community, Lord, to dream out loud and to see you high and lifted up. And Lord, as much as we want to, we're so inadequate for this task, and yet you've provided all the strength and resource that we need. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you that we are accepted in Christ. And let us live like subjects of the king who seek to know the king and make him known. Thank you for the forgiveness that's available in Christ. If there's anyone here today who hasn't yet asked Jesus to be your savior, the way to do that is to recognize him as your Lord. As soon as you choose to submit your life, Jesus has promised to forgive you of all the sin that would separate you from the true and living God, and that you would receive a spiritual birth so that you could know God and be empowered to live for him from this day forward. And if that's you right now, just let God know that you're ready to surrender. Father, for your glory, we ask that your kingdom would come that your will would be done on earth, in our hearts, in this place, as it is in heaven. Amen. Let's partake.